Josie talk. Okay, we got the recording in progress. And, and then, uh, so as as was talked about briefly during the the um, the little chat, you know, Josie's been an ecologist well over a decade with experience in so many uh, restoration projects. So. Uh, working with Irvine Ranch Conservancy, Natural Resource Management, Department of California State Parks in Orange County, uh, with Dave there, I heard, so that's nice. Study biology at Cal State University, Long Beach, which a lot of times we hear over here, we hear a lot about Fullerton and, and UCI and Cal Poly up in Pomona, but it's nice to have a, a Long Beach uh, grad here. And she's also an active member in our chapter. So even though she lives up that way, she's still still working with us. So uh, welcome Josie and uh, let's get into walking the path of a restoration ecologist. If we can get the screen up. See if I can get this to work. All right, does that look good? Uh, it's, oh, it's only part of the screen. There you go. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Good, technology's working. You'd think after all this time on Zoom, I'd, got, I'd have gotten it straight, but not so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. I just really wanted to thank uh, CNPS for inviting me to talk tonight. This is really one of my favorite topics to share about and uh, such a wonderful audience to share it with. So um, really big thanks for uh, inviting me. And, you know, today I just really want to share some of the stories uh, that really I've experienced uh, working out in the Liso Creek. Uh, there's a, a there's a lot to share um, on each of these lessons. I could probably spend 50 minutes talking about each one. And so I'm going to try really hard to stay on point. Um, so I wanted to kind of start things off um, with a land acknowledgement. And, it, and again, we kind of talked about this a little bit in the pre-chat. But um, uh, and as Dan just mentioned, the, the Liso Creek it, is actually known as the dividing territory between the Ahachi men and Tavanga, but that is contested. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and I don't, uh, I, I don't know a lot about it, but feel free to look at it. But I know that's definitely something that was mentioned to me by the, the archeologists. Um, but the Elisa Creek watershed is located on the traditional homelands of the Hachiman and Savanga people who in the face of ongoing settler colonialism, uh, continue to claim their place and act as the original stewards of their ancestral lands um, as they have for the past 8,000 years. And so we acknowledge our presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hachiman and Tongva people. And we respectfully honor and recognize the original and current caretakers of the land, water, and air, the Hachiman and Tumbunga people, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. And as I join you tonight to share my own wisdom and the lessons that I've learned, um, I think it's really important that we do not forget that the destruction of our wildlands is a direct result of the greed of colonialism and white supremacy. And that it's really important to acknowledge that when we enter into these conversations. Um, if the land had never been stolen to begin with, then we wouldn't need to restore it. And uh, you know, again, I think that there's, there's an opportunity to hold space for that and to honor the original stewards as we continue this really important work. So um, I'm Josie Bennett, uh, as you mentioned. So I'm a restoration ecologist. We're gonna talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, but the main thing to know is that I spend a lot of time out in the field, taking out plants that are not supposed to be here and putting in plants that are supposed to be here. Uh, I picked both these photos on purpose because um, I am only talking in these photos. Um, and you can see I'm, my real goal is to inspire and motivate other people to get out, to get educated about our local open spaces and to 
come out and help us to restore this really important land. And so again, that, that photo down in the bottom, that's me all the way to the right. Everyone is working. And I always say that I'm working too, but it's just a little bit different. I'm actually out, um, this is in West Loma, out in Limestone Canyon. And uh, you know we're, we're learning about different habitats. And so this was a grassland habitat that we were learning about and a really wonderful opportunity to connect some long-term volunteers. So I often have a hard time explaining what I do for a living. Um, to this day, I don't know that my mom could really explain what I do. Uh, and you know, that kind of comes up with our, our crew a lot. They'll say, how do, you, how do you explain to people what you do? And um, you know, we often call ourselves um, extreme gardeners, right? We spend a lot of time doing things that you, know, you do in your own backyard or your front yard, but we do it on a much larger scale and much more intensely. And so I saw this, I thought this was pretty funny because there's just so many perceptions around, again, the way that people view the work that we do, the way we view our own work, and then actually what we're doing, which that photo is, if there was a lot more vegetation, that really truly would look like me. Uh, and one thing that I wanted to add to is that there is so much work um, that goes into supporting the conservation um, and you call it like work of an ecologist and it's a lot of it is you know office work it's not as it's not as pretty as this um, so often one of the misconceptions that I get for myself is that I work out in the field 100% of the time and um, I was like oh no you know I'm back at the office I'm out in you know the field maybe 20% of the time um, but our field techs when they first start they are definitely out there most of them for 100% of the time so they work a 40 hour shift completely outside So again, this is probably the best audience that I could ever have because, you know, really at the heart of a restoration ecologist is a real love and appreciation for native plants. And so it's something that I've definitely dedicated my career to and um, have been really just honored to work in lots of different places, as Dan mentioned. Um, you know, I think I might be going for the record for um, the person that's worked in the most uh, different open space units in Orange County. And I take a lot of pride in that. And it's a, been a real honor to work with so many just wonderful people ahead of me, like Dave Pryor, like Yuta Berger, Megan Lulo, you know, all of these restoration ecologists that have just done so much good work here in Orange County. And again, at the end of the day, what are, what are we really passionate about? Uh, it, it's native plants. I mean, even for those of us that tend to be a little bit more focused on wildlife, um, or you know, larger scale habitat issues at, at the um, you know at the real bottom of it is just kind of our plant communities and a, a real appreciation for all of the amazing open space that we do have here. So today I'm here to really kind of share some of the stories that the Elisa Creek has shared with me over these last five years that I've been working um, with the Laguna Canyon Foundation. So the Aliso Creek watershed is a pretty unique watershed. Um, it's one of the only, it might be, and I believe it might be the only water course that runs, you know, all the way from the mountains to the sea through the San Joaquin Hills. And so, um, you know, when you look at kind of, like the different waterways that we have and the different watersheds. Um, the Liso Creek is a pretty complicated watershed. Um, seven cities drain into it. About 70% of the watershed is actually developed um, in, con in concrete now. And so the restoration work has really focused on kind of the lower six miles for restoration. And then watershed wide, we've been working really hard on invasive control. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But again, the Lisa Creek, it's one of the major stream systems in, in Orange County. It runs for a little under 20 miles. And, and again, it, it originates in the foothills of the Santa Ana Mountains, um, I believe near Whiting Ranch. And it drains all the way at the Liso Beach, um, so straight into the Pacific Ocean. It's one of the last remaining soft bottom creeks in Orange County. And it's a critical, wildlife corridor that connects the mountains to the sea. And even though, you know, like, like I mentioned, a lot of the watershed is, you know, concrete now, it still creates a connectivity 
from the mountains to the sea. And so a lot of different organizations are working really hard on trying to, um, you know, uh, trying to find ways that they can use that momentum to increase that connectivity. Um, it's a, but one of the things that's really amazed me at, from working in all these different open space units is just how much, um, how wild this area is. You know, if you look at an overhead map of the Aliso Creek watershed, and particularly the areas where we're doing our restoration work, you'll see that it is almost completely urbanized. And someone along the way had the foresight to include this section of the Aliso Creek in the Aliso and Wood Canyons um, Wilderness Park. And so it's the Northeast Eastern Extension. And, um, I suspect that most people that are in this area of the Liso Creek have no idea that they're in the wilderness park. It's, um, there's a Liso Creek bike path that's heavily used. And um, we always kind of joke too, when anything goes wrong, that there's a Walmart right across the street. So we're doing the best that we can. It's a real different feel for being in the backcountry at Crystal Cove, being in the backcountry of Limestone Canyon or Whiting Ranch. Uh, this is an area that has a high school, a middle school, and an elementary school all along uh, the course of our restoration. And somehow even in that, we have this really beautiful wild space uh, that was, has been in real trouble. And so, you know, the, the history of the Liso Creek, it's very much the history of almost all of our open space in Southern California. It has a long history of ranching. Uh, this is part of the Moulton Ranch in this area. They had sheep and different kinds of cattle. And then in, starting in the 70s, we had this rapid urbanization that led to the introduction of a really increased water flow. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting is that the Aliso Creek probably was not a perennial water source. Um, and we see this a lot with a lot of our smaller water courses. I mean, it's just hard to tell. Um, and so one of the things it's done is it's really created a completely different habitat than maybe even what it used to look like. And so um, perhaps this used to be an intermittent system that just had uh, water flowing through the spring and when rain was available. And then there was dry, dry times. And so there's a kind of a lot of discussion and I wish I had a time machine so I could go back and I could find out really what, um, what this looked like before. But the reality is now that with all of this increased water, Right? It's created a lot of damage to the waterway. And I'm a restoration ecologist and not a hydrologist. And so, you know, there's a lot that I don't really understand about the flow of water. But what I can tell you is that it has really created uh, a lot of incision in the creek and, a, and an introduction to all sorts of non native. Not, not just plants, but also animals. And so, um, again, the way the the way that we look at the creek now is nothing like its natural expression. Um, it's concreted in not just in areas where it's channelized, but in other areas where you know Army Corps infrastructure has been um, added, such as riprap. There's all sorts of drop down structures. So this creek, it, even though it's still soft bottom, is really been impacted by uh, the development of you know mankind all around it, uh, particularly in concrete. And one of the things that's always really interesting is to kind of think about trying to control a water course. And uh, it's not as easy as, you know, as, as you think. One time I tried to, to build a wetland and I found out really quickly uh, that water will do whatever it wants to do. And the amount of rain that we get here is extremely variable. And so um, again, this watershed has really taken a lot of damage from all of these different um, different sources, yeah, sources of stress. Let's see, okay, All right. So some of the habitats um, that we have out at Aliso Creek, and again, this is really amazing. Um, and I just, of course, really encourage everybody to take some time to to head out to the Aliso Creek uh, bike path. It is um, this area is open to the public. Um, you know, you can walk, it's flat, uh, totally accessible, and just a really amazing space. So some of the different habitats that we have out here include riparian, of course, a, a mix of um, 
willow woodland with cottonwoods, sycamores, as well as a right, real nice riparian transitional habitat uh, that feeds right into our upland coastal sage scrub. And so it's a very small area in regards uh, to, you know, thinking about even just kind of the overall acreage of the site, but it really packs a punch. Uh, you, you really would be amazed to see all the different uh, plants that are out there. And I know, gosh, we've even had CMPS field trips out there. So, you know, one of the, the lessons that I've really learned is just how nuanced um, a site can be in regards to the ecotones. And so an ecotone is the transition from one habitat into another. And um, ecotones are really important ecologically because they're an area of just increased resources. And so that's definitely something that we're going to be talking about here tonight. But again, when you think about just, let's just talk about, you know, one native plant, and then we expand that out to multiple native plants, which create a habitat. And all of those individual plants are going to be bringing different resources. Now, when you have two completely different habitats that come together, now we have like a mix of both of those. And so again, because of just the small footprint of the Aliso Creek, and the different degrees of soil moisture, we just see a lot of different habitat expressions. And so this has just led to a biodiversity hotspot. And it's a really amazing thing to see. And um, again, having worked in a lot of different places, when I first came here, I thought, boy, I don't know if this is gonna be very interesting, right? It's right in the middle of, you know, with condo complexes and, you know, the middle school. And I mean, what could, what could possibly be growing here? And I have just truly been amazed kind of over and over again. Uh, you know, there's not a year that's gone by that I haven't found a plant that I haven't seen before out there. And, and sometimes they're even good. <laughs> a lot of times they're not good. Um, but, you know, it, it's been a really just amazing place to explore plant life, even from the trail, without leaving the trail. Um, there's plenty to see. And again, it really goes back to that nuance of having a lot of different ecotones. So um, one of the things that I found really amazing is our our bird observation list for this, um, this area that we're working in, which is about a mile and a half, has about 80 different bird species. And that is the most diversity that I've seen on any of the sites that I've been. And again, I really think that a big part of it is just this really beautiful mix of lots of different kinds of habitats. And um, so you can see here just a couple of photos. These are all from our restoration sites. And, um, you know, it, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on Pecton Hill. For those of you that have been out there, you know, it is its own little universe that I could talk about for um, a full hour. Um, but that the top one there is Pecton Hill. And you, you can see that we just have this really nice mix of coastal sage scrub with willows growing right next to them. And so one of the things that this creates is just a really wonderful habitat for wildlife. Right, and not just uh, you know any kind of wildlife, but some of the most sensitive wildlife that we have in the county, right? And so there's pros and cons to everything. And so um, right now we're going to focus on the positive and just think like this is great. We have a ton of resources for everything, but I also want us to continue to remember that this habitat is in an area that is completely urbanized, and so it's having constant pressure put on it, right, from all sides. So it really, you know, especially in the face of climate change, it really makes, um, makes an important point that we need to keep an eye on areas like this, right? They're going to potentially need some extra um, attention as, as we um, try to deal with, you know, more increased temperatures, you know, um, more rain potentially. That really can um, cause problems to these habitats that are supporting all of this um, just wonderful uh, wildlife that we have. Right. So that was kind of the great part about Aliso Creek, right? Um, and, you know, the realities of the, the watershed, though, again, a lot of it is just has to do with the um, urban sprawl that's in the area. But a, a lot of them just have to do with kind of some of our societal problems. Homelessness is a huge issue out of Aliso Creek. 
as it is in many of our open spaces. Um, we've also, the, the picture to the right here is showing kind of an, a, our annual algal bloom. And um, so one of the things that, you know, is unfortunate about the Liso Creek is that it's actually been added to the Clean Water Act list of impaired waters. Um, and that's for its bacterial levels and um, other point source pollutants that have just, unfortunately, been able to be introduced to the watershed, um, mainly because, again, the main source of water is a runoff, unfortunately. And I didn't get it in here, but we had a horrible, horrible picture of um, part of the creek that ponds that was full of soap, like a giant jacuzzi bubble bath. Um, and it's just something that we see often out here. Um, when the water is flowing, sometimes you can kind of forget and it, you know, it looks beautiful. Um, but unfortunately, the, the watershed, the, the way that the, it has been kind of um, previously managed, it's been hard to stop pollution from um, impacting the actual water. Um, another real big issue that, you know, is not just because of homelessness, but it can be a problem are fires. And so in the five years that I've worked out on this site, uh, we've had three fires um, and they've all been small and they've been well contained, but boy, they were really scary. Uh, and the latest fire that we had um, was started from a homeless encampment and burned about uh, one and a half acres. And um, part of that impacted one of our mitigation projects. And so um, when you have such a small area, again, it makes it much more sensitive. And so when you have problems, those problems are compounded. And so again, it's just something that we really need to keep in mind. Um, you know, one of the things that I've really learned is just how fragile these areas are. You know, one fire can completely destroy a whole project in the blink of an eye. Um, and again, this is something that we're going to have to become more and more used to as we move, um, you know, further along with all this climate crisis that we're in. So I always think this is a really relevant question to ask, which is why bother, right? So the Lisa Creek watershed has been really impacted, right? Is it sustainable to make any changes? Is there anything that we can do? You know, why, why change it, right? The, uh, the watershed has been deeply impacted by invasive weeds. The work that we do is extremely expensive. You know, and can it be done in a way that's really going to make a difference, right? And again, I just think it's a good question to ask. I don't think it's a question people ask enough, right? You know, not all conservation work is sustainable. And so I think it's really important for us to at least understand why we are doing the work that we're doing and why we're doing it in this area. And so, you know, as um, the majority of these photos that are in here are from the Lisa Creek Restoration Projects. And um, I think that really what comes up for me when I think about this is um, just again, how much we are able to impact the animals and the plants that are on the ground. And so whether that be clearing out, you know, invasive arundo or mustard, so our native seed bank can express itself naturally, or we can, you know, create a home for some of these animals that are living out here. You know, I think that those are the kind of things that we really need to identify as priorities. You know, and so again, this is an area that has a huge amount of potential and it has a huge um, capacity for just positive impact to wildlife. And knowing that we have this corridor from the mountains to the sea, you know, also, you know, makes it um, more important to really focus on this area. And um, even though the Lisa Creek has a lot of problems, I think it's definitely uh, has been worth the effort and energy that's been put into it. And who doesn't like another picture of a, of a plant? I'm just trying to get as many plant pictures in here. Okay, so as I mentioned, the Lisa Creek is about 20 miles long. There is a huge amount of energy and momentum being put into the overall restoration of the Aliso Creek. Uh, the Laguna Canyon Foundation, uh, where I've worked for the last five years, has been working in that lower six miles. Um, but this has really been, you know, a, a huge effort across the board with multiple stakeholders, 
seven different cities involved. And one of the things that I really learned was the power of collaboration. And so, um, you know, for people that are new to invasive plant removal work, you know, especially in a creek, you have to work with the people that are upstream. And if you can't get them to um, kind of follow along with what you're doing, then it really puts your project in jeopardy. And so I think one of the things that, that was really monumental for this project is that uh, a group of people came together and they, they put together all of the permitting for Liso Creek in a packet and got it, you know, paid for it and got it approved. And so anybody that wants to do work in this can work with the county and the permitting process is done. And so often that is one of the hardest components of getting a project started. And, and you know, doing the work itself is really difficult, but the permitting process is expensive. It takes years to get done and it's often hard to fund, particularly if you can't show again that these stakeholders are working together and if you don't have any funding for maintenance. And so um, again, I was really just have been, you know, it's it, it's been a privilege to be able to work on a project that had this much forethought put into it, uh, you know, to identify the needs of the project, to set them aside so this area would be preserved, and then to actually make it so that it would be a little bit easier for us to get the work done. And so you can see here, this is, you know, this is just a list of, you know, seven of the projects that have, um, you know, that, that have LCF has really kind of taken the lead with the county on getting mainly the Arundo removed. So, you know, kind of number one and two, we're really spearheaded. It's just like, let's just focus on some of these areas that have large stands of Arundo. Number three, the Dairy Fork Wetlands uh, is a city of Aliso Viejo project that is actually, you know, right above Pecton. I know not everyone knows all the projects, that's fine. But for those of you that do, I'll throw out some of the project names. Um, so the Dairy Fork Wetlands was built. It's a, a gosh, I think it's a, an acre and a half wetland. And that was to collect runoff from one of the biggest tributaries that was bringing water into the creek. And so it's just a real success story of, you know, different stakeholders working together on a shared goal. And we've seen just humongous progress in this work. Now, as you get lower into the watershed, you're going to start seeing some of our actual active restoration sites. So instead of just removing the arundo, we've removed the arundo and the other invasives, and we have come in and actively restored the area. And so between the OCTA project, so five, six, and let's see, five, four, five, and six, we have about 101 acres of active restoration. So the very first step in all of this work was to remove the arundo. And then after that, we really started to identify high priority habitat that was outside of that riparian corridor. So some of the goals in that were to really, again, to just really protect the work that was done in the creek channel. And so as we've seen, um, you know, if a fire starts on a, a hill full of mustard next to the creek, it will impact the creek. And so creating riparian buffers along our restoration has been uh, one of our big priorities as we um, move through this restoration. Uh, and you can see this work is not cheap. So a total of $6.7 million in funding has gone into just these seven projects. And uh, that doesn't even include, again, the, the permitting and planning phase. All right, so some of the accomplishments of just these projects. So it's the creation of native habitat, which is going to increase biodiversity in this really important corridor. Uh, improving ecosystem services and functions, increasing the community knowledge about the Liso Creek. So that includes community events, getting volunteers out, that includes installing interpretive signs and bringing school kids out so that they can learn more about the creek. A real big goal of the program has also been to collect scientific data on the presence and absence of sensitive wildlife species. Uh, that's something that's often um, 
can be hard to fund if you're um, if you're not you know look you know, you know if you're not going to be removing something. Um, so like in your initial stages of work, often you'll do surveys, um, but then there's a lot of data gaps in regards to you know is are there sensitive species on site. You know, is the area um, actually um, making a difference, right, in regards to the abundance of sensitive wildlife species? And so that's been a, a real goal for us. And we've been really lucky to work with the folks over at the Warren Family Fund um, over the last four years. And they have funded Lisa Bell's Barrio surveys, Nat Catcher surveys, and a multi year Southwestern Pond Turtle monitoring program. And that data has actually allowed uh, LCF as well as OC Parks to make some management decisions and to really, again, prioritize different areas for restoration. So without that data, you know, you, you can go ahead and you can pick a couple acres to restore, but it's a lot better if you understand how animals are using the habitat. And so for instance, um, the, we have a 21 acre upland project that was designed completely in service for the southwestern pond turtle, which is our, our local turtle that and we happen to have quite quite big population in the Aliso Creek. And come to find out something that I learned that I never knew is that this turtle actually nests in upland habitat. And again, it really speaks to those ecotones that I mentioned. So really understanding that you know, it's, it's actually, I don't want to say it's easy, but it is a lot easier to get funding for uh, riparian and wetland projects. And so one of the challenges is really then under, like looking at the ecosystem holistically and the landscape holistically. And so, you know, we've come through and we have actually already restored the riparian corridor. So what next? And can we get funding for that? And so by being able to tie the restoration work that we're doing to actual quantitative data that's collected on sensitive species, we found that to be a really winning strategy for you know, designing some of the work that we're doing. And again, you know, um, all of this work benefits not just the sensitive species that we've identified, but all of the species that are out there. And so, um, and, I, and again, I'll talk about this a little bit um, towards the end of the project, but I've seen just a really beautiful um, return of many uh, wildlife species on our site over the last five years. And um, that makes it just really rewarding for the team that are out there, but it also just really shows, um, you know, how, how beneficial native plants are to our local wildlife. And then one last thing I'll mention, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about collaboration. Um, you know, we've worked really hard to develop and strengthen key partnerships to facilitate collaborative planning and management. And, you know, uh, I think that, again, we kind of talked about this in the chat. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of us kind of in the field that know each other well and enjoy working together. But the realities are that, you know, um, different stakeholders are going to have different goals and different metrics for success. And so, um, and, and a lot of times people aren't gonna have the capacity to really work together. And that's just kind of the reality on the ground. And so, you know, ideally we'd all be working together, particularly when you think about areas that share a boundary, right? But are not necessarily, that's kind of a, a made up boundary, right? It doesn't actually, the watershed does not um, actually acknowledge that. And so anytime we, we have um, areas like that, it's really important that we have a great relationship with the people that are working right next to us. And the Lisa Creek uh, Collaborative Group has been um, developed over the last couple of years and it's being headed up by the County of Orange. And they have just done an amazing job at bringing together all of the stakeholders for the Lisa Creek watershed. And I mean, they have, I mean, up to hundred people can attend these meetings. A, a lot of different people with a lot of different opinions on how this area should be managed. That would include the water districts, that would include the land managers, and that would include the ecologists who are trying to do restoration. And so again, just bringing them together so that we can all um, you know, use our different, um, you know, different funding sources and our different expertise so that we can design projects that will not only get funded, but that will be successful is just a really important component of um, our success. 
Okay, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about habitat restoration. And this is mainly because anytime I try to write a blog post about this, they um, edit out everything I'm about to say because nobody wants to talk about native plants as much as me. But now that I'm here, I know that you guys will enjoy learning a little bit more about you know, what it really um, entails to be a restoration ecologist and some of the things that we think about as we're designing a project. And so this is actually Agua Shannon in Limestone Canyon. So this is one of the last projects that I worked on um, when I worked for the Irvine Ranch Conservancy. And so this is often um, what a project looks like. Um, and I actually, you know, worked with Megan Lulo to walk this site and to actually develop the different areas that would be restored. And so um, that was an area with a lot of really beautiful intact habitat and um, these little pockets of disturbed areas. And so when we talk about the goals of restoration, it's just, uh, it's, you know, here's some of the different components that we want to think about. So we want to increase native plant cover. I think that's pretty obvious. And um, as you can see here in this original picture, we have, a, you know, a big stand of non-native grass. So the goal is to kind of remove that and then to introduce native cover, but then to also let that natural expression of the seed bank come out. Um, often one of the things that uh, I, I find really interesting is when you come out to a site, you know, how do you know what should be there, right? And, and a lot of uh, that takes just some expertise, understanding the area, and then you get a good feel for it, but you can also spend um, the first couple of years of a project, if you have funding, just doing site prep and just going ahead and removing those non-natives and seeing what natives come up. Another really important component is increasing plant species richness. So again, thinking back to that idea that you have one native plant and then you have multiple native plants and they all kind of work together. And so that's just really abundance of different species and diverse, so plant diversity. So I want a lot of native plants and I want a lot of different native plants. And then again, we get to get even um, more, you know, deep into this. Um, we wanna have a lot of different plants, but we wanna have a lot of different plant functional groups. So a plant functional group would be grasses, that would be large shrubs, small shrubs, wildflowers. We wanna have a, just a variety out there. We wanna have plants that bloom in the spring, plants that bloom in the fall, right? We, we really wanna think about this as resources for wildlife. And then last, we wanna think about increasing the number of plant layers. Right, so that would be plants that are small, plants that go up to your knee, plants that go up to your neck, all the way up to you know 12 feet up, right? All of that is going to increase diversity and resources. All of those resources are going to translate into more opportunities for um, wildlife to use those resources for shelter, for food, and for all sorts of things. So that was a lot of words. Um, I always like to throw in just some photos. This, this kind of will show you what I'm talking about. Um, so this is our Pecton Reef project. And uh, this is after the first year of site prep was complete. And so you can see that we've already come through, we've already you know, mowed down and removed all the thatch in this area. And um, this, this spot was pretty much all mustard with some artichoke thistle mixed in with non-native grasses. Um, and again, right to the left is the, the riparian corridor and to the right is the Aliso Creek bike path. So, um, and, and right in front of us is the 73. So again, really just wanted to highlight um, the urban environment that this really important riparian corridor is in. So this is back in 2018 when we first started the project. And then this is what it looks like. This would be last June. And so again, thinking back to kind of how I was explaining um, you know, what habitat restoration is all about. We, we want to increase the number of native plants that we have. We want to increase, you know, the different kinds of plants that we have, and then kind of the different heights. And so some of the things that we're um, actually talking about here are just structural complexity and diversity of the vegetation. And again, um, as native plant enthusiasts, I think you guys can really appreciate that there's just a lot of different kinds of plants, right? 
And as you're looking at this, again, thinking about that, um, that gradient of soil moisture. So this, this can actually, this small snapshot that we're looking at can actually include multiple habitats. As we move further away from the creek, we're going to have less soil moisture and we're going to have more upland species, more coastal scrape, um, coastal sage scrub. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting um, over the last five years is as the arundo has been removed from the creek, the creek has changed quite a bit and changed the actual um, you know, way that it's braided and, and actually changed um, a lot since when I first started. Uh, one of the big issues in this area was just incision. And so the creek ends up being you know, 15 feet lower than what it should be. And so what that leads to is a disconnection from the floodplain. And so if you think about kind of the natural, uh, the natural um, way that a creek would be flowing, when you have a high flow event, you would have the water hit the top and it would flow out and then that would then create more riparian transitional habitat. Now with that kind of incision, what you, what you end up seeing is a lot more upland habitat that butts up directly right against these willow trees. And so, um, you know, it's something that we tried to be really thoughtful about uh, when we were planting so that we could put um, different pockets of riparian transitional species and, and then also just put more plant material out and then let kind of the habitat, let us know what would work and what wouldn't work. And so um, for our different projects, we, we use a couple of different approaches to installing plant material. Um, and a lot of that has to do with particularly just how dry it's been. I think, you know, the, this decision to be a restoration ecologist at this time has been a, has been a real um, adventure in the weather. And over the last, you know, uh, 12 years, 13 seasons that I've been doing this, I've just seen a real dramatic change in the weather patterns. And one of the, the biggest things that's impacted our ability to do our restoration work is, um, is really just the, that the rain seems to be delayed. So where it used to be that, you know, occasionally we would get a germinating rain in October, um, you know, but we pretty confidently get, you know, rain in November or December. Now it's not guaranteed that we will even have a rain by February. And, um, you know, as we think about kind of the natural season of a restoration ecologist, you know, we do kind of our site prep and, you know, train our team in October and November so that we can go out and do our weed work and start planting. Um, and when I very first started, that is the cycle that I, that, that, that I lived, um, where we planted and seeded in November. And the reality is that, um, you know, for the last three, four years, it's just not feasible. Um, and we're seeing a lot of repercussions from this. Um, and it's really um, something, again, as we move deeper into this climate crisis that I think we're really going to have to, um, you know, think about and address how we can uh, actually actively get plants that are gonna survive. Now that might mean that we need to use more irrigation. It might mean we need to use a more mixed approach um, to plant material. I think that there will be a lot of discussion about this in the future. Um, but one of the things that we've done out on our sites is to do both seed and container planting. And again, that's mainly just, um, you know, bet hedging. We want to make sure that, it, you know, we can actually have native plants that are going to survive. Many of our projects are state funded grants, and so they have a smaller a time frame for success. And so uh, if you throw seed out and it doesn't rain, you're not going to have much to show anybody. And so um, we've been pretty successful here. Although I will share that this project um, was seeded in a year where we actually got a, a really good rain. So. Okay, let's see what I did. There we go. Nothing like a little excitement. Okay, so again, just wanted to show another kind of before and after photo as you guys are kind of getting um, like a better understanding of what restoration is all about. And, um, you know, some of the areas here that you can see, this is more of a, this is a riparian area, kind of a wetland habitat that we were working in. 
And um, one of the things that's really amazing about riparian habitat is that it's really designed to restore itself. So in, you know, a natural um, riparian habitat, uh, if a willow branch is to break, breaks off, it'll flow down the creek. If it lands in dirt, it will sprout. And so this really dynamic system, I don't, again, I don't wanna say anything's easy because it's not, but it's, it's uh, one of the easier habitats to restore. And you can see here, the angle is a little different on this photo because it's practically impenetrable, right? Um, and this, this gives you a little bit of an introduction to that kind of riparian transitional riparian area. So we have a, a native nettle, then we also have coyote brush growing right alongside the willow. And again, just to reiterate, we wanna increase plant cover. We wanna increase the number of different kinds of plants and functional groups. And then we also just really um, want to think about those layers. So you can see here we have willows that are really tall all the way down to kind of our smaller shrubs. And all of this is creating habitat. And so um, I'm going to flip back here really quick. One of the ways that I kind of think about this too, and I, I've kind of described this, um, is particularly in regards to the climate crisis, is that when you look at kind of this first area, this first habitat that we encountered, um, you see a lot of bare ground, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? But in this area, um, it's not, it's definitely not natural. And so it really leaves this area um, susceptible to, you know, non-natives, which we are constantly getting a new flesh of, right? Uh, this area actually, and you can kind of see it in the background, is um, adjacent to a pocket park in the city that has all non-native trees. And so the creek is constantly being inundated by um, you know, non-native pines and peppers and all sorts of things. And so you, know, you have this real um, open space. And so it, in, an, in a natural system, you really wouldn't worry about that. You would like to have open space. Um, but here it definitely, you know, that if you turn around, you might come back and have a grove of pepper trees growing. So one of the ways that I kind of talk about this as well um, is again, thinking back to resources and thinking um, about, you know, what would happen if, you know, an area like this did burn, you know, what would happen to the wildlife that are living here? Where would they go? And um, I think that really, again, at the heart of so many of the problems that we have is just the limited space for, um, you know, animals to have that connectivity. So if you get this area and it becomes, um, you know, in any way compromised, it's going to put pressure on the, the sensitive species that are already living in, um, you know, further, whether that be upstream or downstream. And so everything we can do to protect these areas is just crucial. All right, so now that we've talked all about plants, one of the things, um, right, that has a direct correlation to the vegetation community is the wildlife. And so again, this is a mix of photos from our wildlife camera program, as well as some amazing photos that were taken by some of my uh, crew members. And uh, so one of the things that, like I said, it's been a real treat for me over the last five years is just to really see the changes in the wildlife that we have on the ground in our restoration sites. And, um, and as I mentioned, I was pretty surprised at how just how wild this space is. Um, we've come across all sorts of animals, um, you know, and the, the crew has many a story to share about uh, all the different things that they see out there. And so one of the real treats last season was this photo down here to the left um, when we had our first bobcat sighting in in our project site and so again this is really hard work um, you know it, it's not easy it's not for the faint of heart and to be able to see that we're actually really making an impact on the wildlife that are out there it's just been something that's been so inspiring and um, we've been really thankful again for some of the funding that has allowed us to do this monitoring because it's not always an easy sell and when you're writing a grant um, for habitat restoration, you'll often find that funders don't want to do the funding for monitoring like this. But not only does it tell just a really great story, 
but it actually shows, you know, your stakeholders and the people, um, you know, that are potentially, this is what's ironic, the people that are going to fund your project, it really shows that you're having an effect on, um, on the land out there. And so, you know, we can also, it's a little hard to see this one to the right. We actually also had a deer out there, which I thought was pretty amazing. If you're familiar with the site, um, you know, we are not, we are connected to the, to the actual um, Aliso and Wood Canyons Park, but it's kind of, it's, it's a stretch that there would be a deer there. Um, we often come across coyotes and um, even, you know, you, again, this, this is the urban wild land interface. That's pretty much the whole area that we're working in. And um, so, you know, there will be days that we'll see coyotes walking along the sidewalks. They'll come up, you know, into the, the local neighborhoods. Um, and so it, it's a really interesting and amazing place to be. Uh, we recently even just saw a great horned owl um, out on our site. And it, one of the ironic things is that a lot of the raptors that are there will actually nest in the, um, the, the large trees that are in the neighborhoods and then they'll hunt in the native open space where we are. And so again, you can just see they're using all of the resources uh, you know, as they should be. Uh, they've adapted to living in this area when it was degraded. And so anything and everything that we're adding to the habitat is just really um, making things more sustainable, right? That's a really big part of the work that we're doing. You think about um, wildfire risk, you know, all, all sorts of other, um, you know, things that could compromise, right, the, the ecosystem, you know, just in general, native plants at the foundation are things that are going to protect this area. And so this might be a little hard to see, but this just happened to be something that we caught on our wildlife cameras, which is actually a pregnant coyote. And then we actually um, took multiple photos of her carrying her pups. Um, and then we're able to kind of watch the pups as, as they grew. And again, just really highlighting, you know, what a wild place this is. Uh, this coyote photo down in the bottom left, it's just taken on the service road right next to our yard. And um, again, going back to kind of that disconnection that people have, you know, with nature, you know, this is really, um, something that we are deeply connected to, but that, you know, you hear, gosh, I mean, who's heard, you know, bad press for being a coyote, right? We don't want coyotes, obviously, you know, eating our animals or, you know, um, interfering with our homes. But the reality is that we have areas that, um, that where they need to live as well that are adjacent. And so kind of working on creating um, relationships, you know, with that open space and with the way that these houses are laid, I think are really important. All right, so, you know, that's kind of just laying things out and just kind of, you know, showing you guys a little bit about what our work is, you know, what our work is all about, you know, as a restoration ecologist, there's so much that, um, you know, there is to learn every day, really the backbone of restoration is adaptive management. And there's, you know, so much work that needs to be done, you know, and the reality is that, you know, the earth is in trouble. Right, that's no news to anybody here, um, you know. And and one of the things that I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about as well is just kind of in, in our society these days, you know, people are are really not that connected to nature often, right? Um, you know, there are, um, you know, children aren't really taught these things as much anymore. So and obviously, I'm I'm talking to people that already agree with me, which is wonderful. But I think it's really important that we have. Uh, dialogue with everyone, right? And, you know, children are more likely to be able to name a corporate brand name than a native tree, right? That's just the reality that we live with. Um, you know, and, and most people have kind of forgotten that we are really not separate from nature, but that we are actually part of nature. And so uh, a really big part of my work has really been connecting people to the open space so that they can be inspired and motivated to do this work as well. And so I think, you know, as folks that are with the California Native Plant Society, you know, for all of us, you know, whether we just be um, volunteering, whether this be our profession, it's just really important that we learn how to talk to people about this work in a way that will include them. 
And so one of the things that I've really learned is that's hard, right? Um, I'm a scientist. Um, I love to talk about the structural complexity and diversity of vegetation. I could talk about it all day. Um, and, you know, that's a, not a great fit for the general public, is what I've learned. And that's okay, right? So kind of meeting people where they are and really learning, um, you know, what your audience is interested in can have just like a huge, a huge impact on your ability to communicate with them. And so, um, you know, again, here I am talking to you about restoration, but, and this came up with the chat, I've actually found that my work is um, deeply connected to just people, whether that be people that are really passionate about what I do or people that maybe don't um, see eye to eye with me, but it's just being able to connect with people so that I can help them to find their connection to nature is just a critical component to the future success of conservation. Um, and so again, you know, people that have a diverse background maybe haven't had access to the open space that they, you know, that they should have. And so it's really important that we create, you know, inclusive like opportunity so that everyone can be out in nature, right? So I often would say, uh, you know, Laguna Canyon does not belong to the people of Laguna Beach. That is a regional resource that belongs to all of us, right? And um, that, I think that's just really important. And I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be um, done on that, but it's something that really needs to be folded into the conservation work that we're all doing. You know, and again, here, we're a group of people that are deeply connected to nature. Um, you know, and, and, and some of us have even dedicated our whole careers to this work and um, really just um, being able to understand that the general public maybe haven't had those opportunities. And um, you know, that we need to focus on ways that we can create meaningful communication with them so that they can again find that connection. And, and like I said, I could spend a whole you know, hour talking just about this. And, um, and I probably will continue in other venues. So, um, but a little bit more about that is just. I really just wanted to share just this really quick breakdown of you know different ways that people gather information. Um, so again, when we think about restoration ecology, and everyone's now wondering why I'm talking about communication, you know, one of the things that has really come up um, in regards to the climate crisis is scientists' inability to communicate information in a way that will connect with people, right? And again, if we can't connect with people, how will we convince people? to do the work that you know, we wanna do? How will we get people to fund our projects? How will we get the support we need? Um, and then I think another real big component that I won't spend a whole lot of time in is um, the issue of herbicide, right? And you know, people have a lot of opinions about that. And a lot of people um, you know, uh, have opinions that I don't necessarily agree with, but I think it's really important that we be able to have those really important conversations so that it doesn't necessarily impact our ability to do our work, right? So a couple of just little things to think about, the different ways that people gather information. So, you know, many, and of course, everyone uses all of these. So I think that's really important, but we tend to be skewed kind of one way or the other. So for people that, um, you know, are mainly using their brain to think um, reason and rationale, studies, data and proof, that's all they need to know. So for instance, uh, comprehensive studies from all, the around, all around the world prove that invasive weeds are detrimental to av avian populations. Sold, I don't need to hear anything else. I heard the information, you, people, people researched it. I trust scientists. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make sure that I support causes to remove weeds, done. So another way that people gather information is through their gut. They use intuition and instincts and they tend to rely on experiences and case studies. So for instance, ever since my yard was taken over by weeds, I have noticed fewer bird species. Now, if you're a scientist and you heard this, you'd want to know how, how many, like what, how large the sample size was, right? Which is not um, a, like a, you, you know, something that people really think about. And so, you know, again, this is something that we've really seen recently over the last couple of years in regards to, you know, COVID, things like that. You know, being able to understand the information and the data that's being put out by scientists, sometimes it's really challenging. 
I actually find it to be sometimes confusing and I have a lot of experience with data analysis. And so, you know, making sure that we're communicating information to people in a way that they can actually understand it is really important. And so the last, uh, the last you know, example I have here is, you know, people that kind of gather information with their heart. So they tend to use emotions and feelings, stories, imagery, and metaphors. And, you know, an example of that is just, you know, birds are my favorite animals and I want to create good home for them so they're safe. So again, just really, you know, touching into that emotion. Um, and so there's not, a, you know, really a right or a wrong to any of this. Like I said, we all have these different ways that we gather information. Um, but I just think it's really important that we remember this and we honor this. This is a, a real um, way, like a really important way that you can increase like inclusivity is by understanding that not everybody can gather information, you know, um, you know, in this kind of brainiac way. Right. And so, again, um, particularly for the climate crisis, like if you really want to um, see this, like just Google and, and watch some videos about people talking about climate change um, scientists first. And then think about the fact that, you know, what is the skill set of a scientist? Is it is it to tell stories? Is it to connect with people? Um, and if not, then, you know, what, what is that intersection? Like, how can, how can we get people to do this really important work that we feel so passionate about, right? And so I think that there is a lot of work to be done on this as well. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, looking at, you know, especially some of the young climate activists that are out now, uh, they're not spouting facts, right? They're out really using their heart and, and leaning into trusting science. And so I think that there's, a, that there's gonna be a lot that we're gonna see um, in regards to the way that we're communicating with people. All right. And, you know, again, just really back to how important it is to offer opportunities for people to get outside. Right. And not just us. I love, you know, our CMPS field trips. I love taking you guys all out on a tour. Um, but it's it's really important to get everybody that you can out on site. Um, and I really love this picture on the right because this is an example of a corporate volunteer event. So this is um, an organization that has made a goal that they will offer opportunities for their workforce to go out and volunteer on different projects. And so, um, and I remember this event really clearly because um, I started doing my whole spiel that I give and they all started to glaze over. And I was like, okay, we gotta get out there. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I need to stop now. Too much information. Um, these guys didn't necessarily wanna come out here, but they wanted to be able to volunteer. And so really meeting people where they are and finding ways that you can connect them with restoration. I mean, like I said, you can see the joy in both of these photos. Um, people love nature, right? That's one of the, the ironies of you know the, uh, the degradation of our land is that we're loving it to death. Um, the outdoor industry is one of the biggest industries that there is. And so people just are kind of disconnected, you know, from the, their own impacts to the land. And so if you can take them out, and I'll tell you, if you can get them to weed for an hour, you could convince them to use herbicide. That's my experience, right? If you can show them the work that they're doing and how difficult it is, you know, then, then they're ready to start having those conversations with you, you know, about, um, you know, how important this area is. And so, you know, this is LCF's, one of their, uh, one of their mottos, protect what you love, right? And I think it's just hugely important to make sure that you're having people with a diverse backgrounds out on your site and is part of your workforce, right? And, and if you can start them young, like this, this little one, even better, give them family-friendly opportunities so that they can come out and they can um, find what they love about nature, right? It's really important that we don't take people out and start lecturing them about the way that I connect with nature or you connect with nature, right? Let them find their own connection and then support them in that. That's really important. All right, and there are so many logos that I could barely fit them on here. But again, I just really wanna highlight how important this um, stakeholder collaboration is in all this work. 
Um, you know, here in Orange County, we're really lucky to have so much amazing open space and uh, we can't do this work alone. And so this right here is just, just one small area that we've been working in. These are all of the different partners that have worked with us. And um, it's, it's a great example of, you know, a bunch of passionate people working together for common goal to do something really amazing. And that's it. Yeah, I'm a little, might be a little bit over. Sorry, guys. That's fine. We're all here. We're all okay, listening. Okay, everybody, yeah, sorry about that. But. Yeah, so we are running up against our, our regular time, but there are a few questions came up in chat. So I want right. to get a couple of the directions mentioned there and see what uh, you have thoughts. So coming from Ron, and it kind of fits into what you're talking here at the end. Any thoughts on how to balance conservation with access and recreation? Since yeah. access and recreation kind of brings people in to understand and take it away from there. Yeah, I think you really have to have a great relationship with the people that are using your open space and you have to get them to understand the pressures. And I think that it's hard. I think it's hard. Um, you know, I think there are times that you um, might need to uh, limit access. Right. And I think that that's what one of the problems that we're having is the public is not really accepting that. So, for instance, if an area burned, you know what, we need to give it a rest. And so I think, again, just getting people involved and getting them on the ground as much as possible, um, you know, hopefully makes a big difference because I'm a huge component of access. And I think that it's important to not close things off completely, um, but you have to find a balance. So it's oh, that's a hard one. And then we had a series of questions from Lynn Hillman and Daniel Koops, water related. So let's go to the first one about inter, uh, actions, interactions with water departments in that area. Yeah, you know, and I don't work directly with any of the, the water districts, but, you know, that's a great example of, you know, a real different um, set of goals than I would necessarily have. Right. Um, and so I know one of the things that was really powerful that I heard once um, in the, the discussion of the Lisa Creek collaboration group was one of the water districts said, you know, you can't stop the water because we own it. <laughs> I was like, wow, you know, that's a great point. And that's something that we have to keep in mind. And so I think really working um, on th that key co like collaboration with those stakeholders is really important. And, you know, many water districts have some great ecologists on staff. And so they kind of understand um, you know, they understand what's going on and it all has to do with, can we all work together? Okay, then building from there, the next two questions I have, let's see. Uh, let's see, there's something about the water being polluted. Is it causing local animals to be unhealthy? Uh, would it be better to be inaccessible or start uh, clarity? options farther yeah. upstream what so and i can't i'm you know we haven't done any kind of testing on the animals but we haven't really come across that many sick animals out there and you know it, we the turtles for instance they seem to be doing just fine and um you know it's definitely something we think about like we wouldn't want to go in the water but here you go they're they're thriving in this habitat and so i i would say you know um, continue to do good work, try to limit pollutants, and let, let the kind of populations take care of themselves. Has the restoration had any positive effects on water quality? Absolutely. So the removal of Arundo um, and the introduction of native plants is something that really can stop erosion. And, and really can slow water down. So, you know, areas where there's bioswales installed, right, that's all slowing the water down. Um, native plants have a much more dense root system. And so it anchors things in, and then it allows for like a slower filtration of the water, which is gonna clean the water up. We can't, we probably can't clean it all up, but it's definitely had an impact on, um, a positive impact on water quality. Okay, I'm gonna have to make a decision between all these others for one last question. How about Rebecca Crow? Were there any plants that you observed coming up from the soil seed bank in the restoration project? A lot. If we'd had to call Ron all the time. Ron, what in the <laughs> heck is this? Yes, absolutely. Dozens of species that we didn't plant came up naturally. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, po positive, well, positive and negative, but some things, okay, good. Okay, I think we've come to the end for now. Thank you for joining us and giving us that insight to right the center of our county, a big a river stream there. Um, 
So everyone, uh, either if you're visual, go ahead and give a clap, or if you want to do an emoticon or thumbs up, whatever. Let's thank Josie. Let's see some claps, thumb up, some more clapping. Very good. Okay. Uh, one last shout out for seeing everyone hopefully next month when we have our some of our O'Neill grant winners talking, the students and the projects they've been doing. Otherwise, I think we are done for the night. Unless Daniel, Ron, anyone else has something else to say or any closing remarks from Josie? I would just thank you to everyone and, and hello to all the names that I recognize. Thank you guys for being here and thank you guys for um, asking me to speak. Okay, very good. Okay, everyone. Good night. See you another time, hopefully on the trails.